Good morning, good morning. I hope everybody's doing okay. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you've had a good week. We have any birthdays this week? Anybody have a birthday this week? You did. She got to spend her birthday in a resort vacation suite, room 502 of Mercy Hospital. It, it, it was a very expensive trip. And so uh, she got to spend her birthday there. Any, any uh, anniversaries this week? Okay, kind of a quiet week. What a great week as we continue to, uh, as we continue to celebrate, that's the one thing that we do is we celebrate that we serve a risen Savior every day. Not just one day a year. We serve a risen Savior every day. And so thanks for joining us, Mom. And so we're going to be on Lesson 24 today. Any words of praise you might have? Yes, ma'am. Cancer free twice. That's great. Right. Well, I'm excited to have my lovely wife with us today. And so um, pray for her. She's going to jump back into teaching on Tuesday. And so I, I need to, I've got one of those rolly seats in my barn. I love it. I can roll everywhere. I think I need to give her that so she can just roll all over her classroom instead of uh, having to, to walk and stuff. That may help her. Any other prayer requests or praise that you might have? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm. Mm. So, what was it, Trent? Trent Maness. He. He is the pastor at First Baptist Church, Ravia, and he's, they have found cancer on his tonsils. And so uh, be, be praying for them. Um, be praying for him. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Sherry Scott has hip replacement surgery on Tuesday. So be praying for her. She's been in a lot of pain for a long time. And so uh, be praying for Sherry. Be praying uh, for Mr. Scott as he becomes a great nurse. And so that will work well. That's his calling is to be a nurse. Yes. Well, it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great week for sure. Yes, ma'am. The, the uh, teacher at Lincoln that we've been praying for, fourth grade teacher at Lincoln, she did pass away this week. And so we'll be praying for uh, the staff that served with her and students and, and family. And so uh, a lot going on there. And so uh, be, uh, be praying for them. Uh, Cheryl and, um, it's not Calvin, Wilkes, who? Carlin, thank you. Both of them are in the hospital, not the same hospital. And so uh, they are both, uh, you know, one is here at Mercy and one is in Oklahoma City. So be praying for both of them uh, as well. They were on our, on our prayer board. Uh, both of them, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, Debbie. Okay. Um, continue to pray for Julie French. And so she is, where, where's her cancer located? Lymphoma. Okay. 
be, uh, be praying for her. Greg, is he still trying to work? Yeah. Chris Burchett was here today? Well, wonderful. Chris has been in the hospital this past week. Um, she was in the hospital with Angela with some um, heart trouble, and so that's great to uh, see her at church today. She is making a transition from here to, um, to Tulsa area uh, where her, all of her children live. So we'll be praying for her. Anyone else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we, we start our time together. Holy Father, we thank you for a beautiful week that you have given us. Father, we thank you that we can gather together as children of God to worship you, to study your holy word, to bring prayer requests to you. Thank you for the way you have blessed many of us in the sharing this week and how you have strengthened us, comforted us during very difficult times. Father, there are some very difficult things that were mentioned this morning in prayer request. Things that are so much above us, so we come to you, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. We ask you for complete healing. We ask you for comfort in times of pain. Father, we ask you to be with those that uh, have, have buried loved ones this week. Father, we pray that you will strengthen them. Father, we pray for those that are in the hospital, those that are waiting surgeries. We pray for healing for those that have been through surgeries. So God, more or less, we just ask you to hear every prayer that's being prayed right now because we know you are almighty God and you can do that. God, as we turn our hearts to the last part of Luke chapter 22, as we get closer uh, to what the disciples were thinking could be the very end. But we know, as we celebrated last week, it's just the very beginning. And so as we continue to look at that, God, may you be glorified, may we be changed. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Well, last week we looked at Jesus transforming history, and he implemented his sovereign Timeline. We get on our timeline. The disciples had their timeline. The, um, uh, the high priest had his timeline, but he implemented his sovereign timeline. And he also installed or implemented the new covenant, the new covenant of his blood. At that point in time, when you, were, uh, when you sinned, you went to the priest. Priest went in to the Holy of Holies once a year. You made sacrifices through the blood now Jesus is teaching it was through his blood salvation comes. And there's no need to uh, have animal sacrifices anymore with the new covenant. And then um, he incorporated imperfect people. Praise God he uses imperfect people. He uses me and you to do the work that he has planned for us. And he intervened to do what was humanly impossible what is so far above me and you, he can do. And so that's what we looked at at the beginning of chapter 2. Now, we're picking up today's lesson, how to deal, uh, how to, how to deal with this, how to deal with despair and these disparaging times, these desperate times that we look at in measure, in measure. you can tell I'm a music person, in verse 39 through 71. I always like when it goes immediately. There we go. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives, as he often did, and his disciples went with him. When they got there, he told them, Pray that you will not be tested. Jesus walked on a little way before he kneeled down and prayed, Father, if you will, please don't make me suffer by having me drink from this cup, but do what you want and not what I want. Then an angel from heaven came to help him. Jesus was in great pain and prayed so sincerely that his sweat fell to the ground like drops of blood. Jesus got up from praying and went over to his disciples. They were asleep and worn out from being so sad. He said to them, Why are you asleep? Wake up and pray that you will not be tested. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up. 
It was led by Judas, one of the twelve apostles. He went over to Jesus and greeted him with a kiss. Jesus asked Judas, Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' disciples saw what was about to happen, they asked, Lord, should we attack them with a sword? One of the disciples even struck at the high priest's servant with his sword and cut off the servant's right ear. Enough of that, Jesus said. Then he touched the servant's ear and healed it. Jesus spoke to the chief priests, the temple police, and the leaders who had come to arrest him. He said, Why do you come out with swords and clubs and treat me like a criminal? I was with you every day in the temple, and you didn't arrest me. But this is your time, and darkness is in control. Jesus was arrested and led away to the house of the high priest, while Peter followed at a distance. Some people built a fire in the middle of the courtyard and were sitting around it. Peter sat there with them, and a servant girl saw him. Then, after she had looked at him carefully, she said, This man was with Jesus. Peter said, Woman, I don't even know that man. A little later, someone else saw Peter and said, You surely are one of them. No, I'm not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another man insisted, This man must have been with Jesus. They both come from Galilee. Peter replied, I don't know what you are talking about. Right then, while Peter was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered that the Lord had said, Before a rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will say three times that you don't know me. Then Peter went out and cried hard. The men who were guarding Jesus made fun of him and beat him. They put a blindfold on him and said, Tell us who struck you! They kept on insulting Jesus in many other ways. At daybreak, the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses got together and brought Jesus before their council. They said, Tell us, are you the Messiah? Jesus replied, If I said so, you wouldn't believe me. And if I asked you a question, you wouldn't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right side of God All-Powerful. Then they asked, Are you the Son of God? Jesus answered, You say I am. They replied, Why do we need more witnesses? He said it himself. So how to deal with desperate times. Every Christian is going to go through desperate times. Me and you encounter desperate times uh, each week. Could be week in and week out. That was, seems like we're always in the valley. Well, God miraculously delivers us sometimes from these desperate times. And sometimes he answers by saying no when we ask for him to remove these desperate times. And then sometimes we ask him to show us how we can get around these difficulties that we are seeing as a Christian. And he tells us no. And then the lesson says, for the third time we plead to their father, there is no way I can make it through this difficulty. And that's exactly where God wants us. He wants us depending on him to make it through the difficulties. How did God respond? to the Apostle Paul when he asked God repeatedly to take this thorn from his flesh in 2 Corinthians, asking by saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. His power is made perfect in our weakness. God leads each of his children through desperate times and desperate circumstances because he wants us to call upon him. He wants us to call upon him to help us. In this lesson, we will watch as Jesus is led into these desperate circumstances and our Lord now demonstrates these three examples that we're going to see within the rest of chapter 22. Three things to do when your times are desperate. First thing is to submit to our Heavenly Father's will. Submit to His will. Know that we cannot control this. It's out of our abilities. Know that He is the only one that can control it. After finishing the Lord's Supper on the Thursday of Holy Week, 
Jesus leads his disciples to Jerusalem, and he leads them just right outside of Jerusalem to a place called the Mount of Olives. You can see up here exactly, you can see Jerusalem, a black dot, and then, um, I don't know, for some reason, not getting me anything on this, but I did turn it back. So you can see Jerusalem there, black dot, and then the red little, uh, the red little dot there is the Mount of Olives. So it wasn't too far, um, even on, on foot. It was a small mountain that stood adjacent to the city of Jerusalem. These are privately owned gardens that were around that, and the Mount of Olives was the very, was the very same thing. These gardens were separated by rock walls. They wanted to keep all the animals out from eating their olives that they wanted to use and also their income at that time. Jesus knew the owner of the Mount of Olives that we call it, and it had permission to retreat there, to recover there. And this place had a specific name called Gethsemane. So pray that you may not enter into temptation, Jesus was saying in these verses. As Jesus began to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, he began by warning the disciples they need to pray. Obviously, if Jesus needs to pray for strength, the disciples need to pray as well. Jesus himself needed the strength to pass these different difficult ordeals that were about to happen. And the disciples had their own ordeals to face. They were going to have much temptation to face in the coming days as well. And so praying that we will not give in to temptation because temptation is going to be there. As Jesus enters into Gethsemane in this peaceful garden, the evil powers both spiritually and physically, those realms began to work. They began to come together. Those realms of Satan and, and the demons and the pagan Roman government, as well as the scribes, priests, uh, Sadducees, and Pharisees, those that were supposed to be holy, those that thought of themselves as very holy, working against Jesus, and then his own disciple, Judas Iscariot. Very soon, even the other disciples and the Jewish crowd had turned on Jesus. They had abandoned Jesus, the one that they had followed. So during this time, it's a time of great temptation for Jesus, great anguish as well. Have you ever felt totally alone going through something totally by yourself? You feel like no one else knows what I'm going through. They understand what I'm going through. No one is standing with you. This is ultimately what Jesus knew was happening. His closest friends abandoned him. He knows that the evil spirits of the demons and the government and the, the Sadducees and Pharisees, they're all working against him. He felt totally alone. But Jesus' divine mind is fully aware of what is to come in the next hours, days, and knows exactly what he must do. So what instructions do we see in verse 40 that Jesus gives the disciples during these difficult times? Jesus tells the disciples to pray so they will not enter into temptation. He didn't say, pray that there will be no temptation. Pray that you will not enter into into temptation because it is going to be there. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, why are you asleep? Get up and pray. Jesus tells them to get up, pray. You need this strength for the days to come. Jesus alone goes deeper into the garden and he kneels and he prays. And Luke includes these two sentences in Jesus' prayer saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If you are willing, God. Jesus didn't say, remove this cup from me, but if you're willing, if this is part of your great plan, if I submit to your majesty, your power as Lord. So let's look at some words here that were quite profound that we find in the second part of chapter 22. First, the cup, which is commonly used during the Lord's Supper on that Thursday, 
And God's judgment, it, it means God's judgment and wrath in this Old Testament. The blood of Christ. The Bible talks about God's punishment for sin, even all the way to the end as the book of Revelations. All spiritual and physical beings are guilty of sin. They're guilty of rebellion with the drink of the cup of God's wrath of judgment. There is a day coming when he will put fierce judgment upon the earth. And we see that it is described uh, as the destruction of Babylon is described in Revelation 16 as God makes Babylon drink the cup of his fierce wrath. In the United States today and all over the world, Many pastors will get up in the pulpit and, and they will tell us that God is love. And he's love. God is absolutely love. He is salvation. But many times we forget that God also is going to judge. He is our great judge. And he has brought his fierce wrath upon the earth before. And Revelations tells us he's going to do it again. God of love and a judge. This morning, uh, Randy said, there's two ways. I even get that. There's heaven or hell. There's no in the middle. He is going to judge the world. When Jesus suffered and died for the atonement of our sins, he drank the cup of wrath due to us that will happen on the last day. Instead of receiving God's justice, believers will believe God's mercy and his grace. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should remember the cup of suffering that was endured by Christ Jesus. There's another important observation we can make from Jesus' prayer that is going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus felt a great sense of dread, physical suffering. He has asked uh, earlier in our lesson that if this cup can be taken from me, please do so. If it is in your will, there is some dread, there's some agony that he is going to face during this time. So an important observation, we can see in Jesus' prayer, Jesus felt this great sense of dread. And the last moments, Jesus, it said, was in agony and his sweat became like great drops of blood. Now Luke did not say that Jesus' sweat was blood. He said it was like it. It, it looked like blood. So either way, it may have poured down his brow or because of the ting with the blood that you could see it had burst the capillaries or uh, the pores of his, of his face and it went down his brow. However it happened, it looked like blood was coming from him because of the anguish he knew that was coming. Jesus foresees the betrayal. He knows that he is going to be deceived. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spat upon. He is going to be disrespected. He is going to be beat, nailed, hung. He is going to bleed. He is going to gasp for every breath. And ultimately, he is going to die. Jesus knew all those things. He knew what was coming. Jesus knows he then will be resurrected, and his human flesh still dreads this. Nobody looks forward to difficult times. Nobody says, oh good, another valley's coming. Yay! No, that's not, that's not. But we go through those, so we'll look up. So we'll say, God, we can't do this. There's no way in my strength alone I can do this. Only through you. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was crying out to God. It says in the lesson, likewise, we know there will also be a resurrected one day, but our human flesh still dreads the suffering and the life and the death. 
How does Jesus explain this in Matthew 26, 41? He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Have you ever felt that before? Man, you, you say in your mind, this is exactly what I need to do. Jesus is, is leading me this way. But our flesh is so weak, we cannot make that decision. We can't make it work. We have to cry out to God to use us. There, are, there will be times in each of our lives when our fleshly bodies and our minds are overcome with dread, overcome with suffering. You know, this, um, this past week uh, on Friday, I, man, I just, I haven't dropped the boys off very long. I just sat down in my, my chair and I, I'm putting the final touches on the lesson and PowerPoint and everything. And I get a call from Nurse Gracie and Nurse Gracie says, I have Braxton down here. He just says he doesn't feel good. He doesn't have a temperature, but you know, he never comes down here. He's not one of those that, you know, have a boo-boo every five seconds. You know, that's, he, he's, that, he's that wipe a little dirt on it and let's go on kind of kid. And so it concerned her. So I went and picked him up, got him up to the office, and man, he was asleep. We left at noon, got him home. He was asleep till like 7.15, 7.30. And, and I know there's some different uh, things going on, but I, I'm telling you, this kid is a mama's boy. I thought I was a mama's boy, and I am a mama's boy, aren't I, mom? Yes. But this kid, he goes over the top. He is all mama's boy. And I think vacation and then Mercy Hospital vacation of 16 days in a row without mama just wore him totally out. That physical strain, that, that, I mean that mental strain takes a toll on your body. And that's nothing compared to what Jesus had to go through with that mental strain. But it does tell us the, the mental aspect of our days takes a toll on us physically. Man, by 10 o'clock, Angela said, he is back to sleep. Of course, I wouldn't know because 9 o'clock, I've got to be gone. 9 o'clock, 8.30, Brentley and I's eyes are barely holding on. We're party animals, you know, and so they stay up later than that. So Jesus is nearing this time that he is going to be deser deserted. It's a desperate time, and Scripture says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. The disciples were also filled with great sorrow. But instead of praying, what did they do? They slept, and that's opposite to me. When I am filled with great sorrow and when things are going on in my head, the last thing I do is sleep. You usually don't sleep, but man, the disciples, man, they just conked out when Jesus said, you need to be praying. There is difficult times coming. Jesus woke them and he encouraged them to pray. They were followers of Jesus and following him would now bring on great test. The trials had been pretty mild. It was pretty easy sailing with the disciples and Jesus teaching them. Jesus encouraged them to do this for their own sake, not just for him, but they're going to need strength to support him. So dealing with desperate times like Jesus did, we must submit to our Heavenly Father just as he did in verse 22. It says never, uh, 42, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Second one is to stand firm against worldly forces. Stand firm against worldly forces. Jesus uh, gives his final exhortation, his final speech to the disciples. The crowds invade this private garden. There was a multitude the numbers of those who sent to arrest Jesus show that the religious leaders clearly regarded this as a dangerous situation. It was a dangerous operation to be done without risk or riots or failure. They want to make sure 
that nothing went around that. And John says in John 18, Roman soldiers also formed part of this crowd to make sure that everything was on the up and up and that Jesus was not going to lead a rebellion with his disciples and his other followers. The first to appear out of the darkness was Judas. Judas Iscariot, which on Maundy Thursday, which on Thursday Jesus said, go and do what you need to do. He is leading the crowd. He's led the mob to the place where they can arrest Jesus without the public noticing, without more people getting involved. Judas draws near to Jesus and Judas gives him a kiss. And this symbol of this time, a kiss was a blessing. And he betrays Jesus with a kiss. It seems every good thing in the world is corrupt in the dark of night. When a disciple met a beloved rabbi, he led his right hand of the rabbi to his left shoulder and his left hand to the right shoulder and he kissed him. It was a blessing. It was the kiss of a disciple to a beloved master that Judas gives that was a sign of betrayal. It was a sign of this is Jesus. The scripture says, Judas, you are betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. Jesus knew the irony. Jesus knew how he was going to betray him. And so he eventually asked Judas, are you so dead to all feeling that you come and you kiss and you betray? Judas is a good, a good, um, a, a good example of a seared conscience. His heart is so turned away from the things of God, they are shut off that he can no longer think of what he's doing. The crowd who appears with Judas has clubs, they have swords, are the temple uh, security guards and the servants around the command of the high priest. Peter assaults one of them. Peter just jumps in like Peter always does and he cuts off the ear and Jesus does what to Peter? He stops him and he does more that. He rebukes him Calm down, Peter. And he takes the servant's ear and he heals it. He places it back on the servant. What does Jesus then say to the mob? In verse 53, sorry, I had that. Had that. Um, there's many, many uh, photos of that or, I'm sorry, paintings of that. But I, I like that one because, man, it just it shows the innocence to me of, of Jesus and then just the ruggedness of, of Judas and that seared, um, seared heart. In verse 53 it says, They don't seize him while he was daily in the temple, but this is their hour. This is the power of darkness. They didn't, Jesus teaching in the temple, they didn't make a, a scene of it. They did not want rebellion. They did not want people gathering around. They didn't want to have to cause trouble. So they did it in the, in the night. Jesus is having to clean up one of Peter's messes again. Peter jumps. He, he, he uses the sword instead of his brain. And Jesus has to clean it up. The temple guards and the servants, they seize Jesus. They drag him to the house of the high priest for one of many of their interrogations that's going to happen throughout the night. The disciples had fearly, uh, fear fearfully scattered. They got out of there. They wanted nothing to do with that. They were scared to death. Peter follows the mob, but he follows the mob at a very safe distance. When they arrive at the house of the high priest, Peter uh, tries to blend into the crowd. He sees what's going on. Peter denied Jesus three specific ways. First, Peter denies even knowing Jesus to the woman. I do not know this man. Then he denied him to the follower, 
being a follower of Jesus. He says to the man, I am not a follower of Jesus. And finally, he denies even being from Galilee. I do not know what you are saying. And of course, at that point in time, the rooster crowed. Matthew 26, 74 says that the last denial, Peter even began to curse and swear, hoping that it would help distance himself from Jesus. Peter denies knowing Jesus. Peter's response to his cowardly betrayal was a response of, let me make sure, There we go. Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. His response to cutting off the soldier's ear, being at a distance from Jesus, denying Jesus three times, just as Jesus had told him he would do, was bitterness. And he wept and he cried. We should always be humble in our walk with Christ. We all have sin and betrayal from time to time in our lives. Though our spirits want to be perfectly holy, our flesh is weak and we're not able to do that. The very reason we are not able to work for our salvation. We get knocked down, we get beat up. The lesson says, what is our end goal as we fight against the evil powers of hell and earth? Ephesians 6.13 tells us to withstand and stand firm in the evil days. When difficult situations come, standing firm through Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul tells us. So to deal with desperate times like Jesus, submit to your heavenly Father's will, stand firm against worldly forces, and shine light into the darkness. After seeing Peter fleeing into the night, Christ Jesus is blindfolded, he is blasphemed, he is mocked, he is beaten all night, he is interrogated all evening by the Sanhedrin and the high priest. So why does evil people prefer darkness and deception instead of truth? It tells us in John 3, 20. They don't want their deeds to be exposed. They don't want their deeds to be exposed. In the Bible, light symbolizes truth. There are some of our Protestant denominations that begin a lot of their services by lighting two candles at the beginning of it, symbolizing the truth, the light symbolizes truth. This is because truth and light works in the same way. It's a journey that is easy and safe when it's in the light, and it's difficult and dangerous in the dark. How many of you like driving in the dark? How many of you don't mind driving in the dark? I don't mind driving in the dark. I I don't. Angela hates it. She hates driving in the dark. She always tells me, she said, it's, I, she sees all these lights and they come from different, and it's just not her favorite, favorite thing to do. How many of you would say that it's more difficult to drive in the dark than in the light? Yeah, I would. I think it's more difficult to drive in the dark than, than in the light. The one thing I like about it is most of the time there's less people on the road in the dark. You know, a lot of trucker friends say that's the best time for me to drive. Sleep in the day, drive in the dark, because all of us crazy people, we're in bed. They can get on down the road. It's easier in the light, safer in the light. So in the same way, God's truth allows us to navigate these spiritual hazards, these fleshly temptations. It is in the light to our path, knowing Jesus is essentially making good decisions in everyday life. Jesus in the book of John says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have 
the light of the world. In verse, uh, in verse 62 of Luke, when day came, the assembling of the elders and the people gathered together, and they led Jesus away to their council, the Sanhedrin, Though they had been conspiring all night, they still could not come up with any credible accusations against Jesus. So they simply asked him a question. Are you the son of God? So Jesus answered, you say that I am. The phrase simply means I am who you say I am. Jesus is clearly the Messiah, the son of God the living God. And the lesson goes through here as we recognize Jesus and who he claimed to be. He was the son of God. The angels and John the Baptist and and even Satan and the demons knew that he was the son of God. He was the Messiah. The disciples and John Mark and Martha and the centurion who was saved. The Jewish leadership, the apostle Paul, Jesus They knew he was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. Of course, there was only one opinion who really mattered. Who did God say he was? God said, this is my Son, my chosen one. He is the Son of God. Charles Spurgeon says, I must also call him victorious. His persecutors could not make him give way to anger. They could not destroy his mercy. They could not slay his love. They could not cause him to think of himself. They could not make him declare that he would go no farther with his work of saving sinners. Now that men began to scoff at him, they smite him, they spitefully spat upon the Savior. As our Lord is surrounded by darkness and He is surrounded by lies, He is reminding us to stand firm as the light and the truth. What a glorious model we see in Jesus. We see three three ways that we can be strong and be strengthened in these desperate situations. The first one, to submit to your Father's will. Stand firm against worldly forces. And shine light into the darkness. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you remind us that temptation is always going to be here, so we need to be in much prayer. Father, that you will not lead us into that. That our weak flesh will not submit to the temptations of the world. Thank you once again for Luke and his penning of your scripture. That we might today in 2024 be strengthened, be bold through the scripture. For your truth is what sets us free. So God, help us to stand firm and be light in the darkness, just as your son Jesus. In your name we pray these things. Amen. So we have been on this journey now for 24 weeks, and we have a couple of weeks more as we finish up, uh, as we finish up Luke And then getting from Luke, we are going back, as I told you we would, and finish up the Apostle Paul's writing of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then his Titus and Philemon that go together. Um, I I told you I thought we were going to do those right together. And then as as we went on to Timothy and stuff, I thought we needed just a little break from the Apostle Paul because, man, the Apostle Paul... He tells it as it is, doesn't he? So I give us just a little break to the gospel, and now we're going to head back to the Apostle Paul. And he's going to finish out, because remember, he's he's talking to Timothy, and he's talking to um, his churches in these letters. So um, 
the, uh, the week prior, which is not next week, the following week, we'll have these for you and um, we'll be able to give them out to you and we'll be ready for the following week. Have a great day. I hope that you will be faithful to the revival. It's going to be an incredible time. Today at 11, tonight at 6, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is at 6.30. The orchestra and the choirs leading every service and also uh, Dr. Randy Kendricks will be uh, speaking. And so I hope you will be here. Have a great day.